This morning, scripture reading comes from Colossians 3, 1 through 11. Since then, you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. For you died, and your life is now hidden with God in Christ. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived, but now you must also rid yourselves of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other since you have taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge and the image of its creator. Here there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. This is the word of the Lord. Um, today is the first Sunday of the season of Lent, and this is the time uh, where we join with hundreds of thousands of other Christians all around the world, uh, anticipating the season where we move towards Easter. So exactly six weeks from today, on April 12th, we will be celebrating Resurrection Sunday. And the way that we're going to do that uh, is through a celebration service here uh, that morning. And similar to what we did last year, we'll invite everybody to stick around for a big family festival afterwards. And uh, we'll have a barbecue and a party and a good time out in the front lawn. Um, because if there's any time for followers of Jesus to celebrate, it's Resurrection Sunday. Uh, but one thing I wanted to put on your radar about Easter as we start to talk about it, is that for the first time in Antioch's history, I believe this year at Easter, we're going to have a baptism service as part of the celebration. It's something that uh, Christians have done for many centuries, and we thought it would be a really cool way uh, to help celebrate that day. And so if you are somebody who's interested in being baptized... Um, we would love to connect with you. And uh, there's a spot on your connection card where you can jot, uh, make a note that you'd like to be baptized, and one of our pastors will get in touch with you. And uh, Easter should be a really great time to do that. So uh, mark that on your calendar. Sunday, April 12th will be a wonderful time to gather together and to celebrate the resurrection. Sound good? All right, Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. Um, we are going to continue in this series, moving through the Apostle Paul's letter to the church in Colossae. And this morning, I'm really going to focus in just on the first uh, four verses of the third chapter. Um, have you ever felt the need to find yourself? Maybe you've heard people talk that way before, that I just feel like I really need to find myself. We have all kinds of books and movies and stories that kind of tell that narrative of somebody that feels this need to, I need to figure out who I am. I need to find my true self. And where do we look? Where do we go when we feel the need to find ourselves? There's all kinds of kind of classic cliche answers, right? We go on a road trip. I need to get out of home, get, up, get away from everything, and go hit the open highway and figure out who I am. Or there's the classic midlife crisis version of this, right? I need to buy a convertible or get a new wife or something like that. I'm going to try mushrooms. I don't know. Whatever your thing is, I'm going to go find myself. <clears throat> um, you may not think of me this way, but I'm actually a millennial. And uh, this is pretty common in my generation, this language of needing having this, this felt need that I need to go and find myself. The question I want to ask is, do you think that the idea of finding yourself is a biblical one? Do you think that's something that we are encouraged towards 
in the scriptures? Or maybe even more specifically, do you think that's something that's important to Jesus? Do you think Jesus cares whether or not we find ourselves? Because it kind of sounds like more of a Buddhist idea than a Christian idea, doesn't it? Listen to this in Luke chapter 9, verse 25. Jesus says, what good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet lose or forfeit their very self? So interesting, we know that Jesus came as the Savior of the world, and that world that he came to save includes you, and it includes me. And it seems to me that what he's saying here is that he doesn't want us to lose or to forfeit ourselves, but it's implied that rather he has come in part to help us find our true selves. Now, of course, this verse and others like it, they mean more than that, but I don't think they mean less than that. And so I would actually argue that this journey, this quest, or this desire that we have to find ourselves is actually a biblical concept, as surprising as that may sound. See, we hold to a biblical anthropology which assumes that humans are in a relationship with ourselves. And just like any other relationship, that relationship can be healthy or unhealthy. It can be a relationship that's marked by love and care and nurture, or it can be a relationship that's dysfunctional or toxic or even abusive. And so if you've been around Antioch for any length of time, you know that the vision that God has called us to is to join Jesus in the reconciliation of all things, the restoration of all relationships back to a place of righteousness. And one of those relationships that we believe Jesus is on a mission to restore is the relationship that we have with ourselves. So in other words, one of the things that Jesus wants to do in the lives of his disciples is to help us find ourselves. So it's a good thing. It's a good thing to go in search of who you really are. The question becomes, where are we going to look? There's a wonderful spiritual teacher by the name of Henry Nouwen, and he suggests that in the quest to find themselves, most people look in three places. And he frames these up as the three lies. Three places that we tend to go to find ourselves. The first is performance. The lie that I am what I do. Um, remember when you were a kid and adults would ask you, what do you want to be when you grow up? The right answer to that question was, I want to be a firefighter, I want to be a baseball player, I want to be a ballerina, I want to be an astronaut, or something like that. So from a very young age, we're handed a script that says our doing or our being is based on our doing. We answer the question, what do you want to be, by saying what we want to do. None of us answer that question by, by saying, I want to be compassionate. I want to be patient. I want to be honest. So from a very young age, we're told that we are what we do. Now, don't get me wrong. It's not a terrible thing to have some attachment or identity tied up in our vocation or in our work. I think the Bible has a high calling on our vocational identity. That for those of us that are teachers, we don't just teach. We are teachers and so on and so forth. The problem is when our doing or our performing becomes our ultimate identity. And this isn't just for kids, this is for us too. All the different ways that we tend to attach identity to performance, that I am what I've done, I'm defined by my accomplishments in life, I got the promotion, I'm the boss, I'm the CEO, I've traveled the world, I serve other people, whatever it is, I am 
what I do. Or the inverse is also true. If our performance shapes our identity, then we also have to wrestle with what we haven't done. Our failures. I'm a college dropout. I'm a business failure. I'm bankrupt. I'm divorced. Whatever else it is. Now and says this is the first place that many of us tend to look when it comes to the quest of finding ourselves. We look to our performance. For others of us, we look to possessions. The lie that I am what I have, my identity is based on the things that I own, the things that I've accumulated, the things that I've purchased, or whatever it is. I have a nice house, I have a great car, I have a beautiful wife, I have an impressive portfolio, I have wonderful kids, I have this and this and this. And so my sense of identity, worth, and self is tied up in the things that I own. And the third lie, and forgive the high schoolish word, but they all start with P, so that's worth something. It's popularity that I am what other people think of me. Or I am what other people say of me. Or in other words, I am my reputation. And some of us are held captive by the words and thoughts and opinions of others. Our whole life is dictated by trying to gain the approval or affirmation of that guy or that woman or that boss or that group of friends or whatever it is. So some of us are held captive through the, of the, to the opinions of others. Some of us are held captive by our own words, thoughts, and opinions of ourselves. We're not popular enough with ourselves. We've failed to live up to our own standards. We've failed to become who we expected ourselves to be. That I'm not smart enough. I'm not fit enough. I'm not attractive enough. I'm not rich enough. I'm not spiritual enough. I'm not cool enough. And therefore, I don't know who I am. And so all of us, whether it's one of these three lies, performance, possession, or popularity, or many of the other places that we could look to find ourselves, all of us, whether we know it or not, are on this journey. And we're searching in these kinds of places. And if you don't think you're doing this, then you're not paying attention. Because you're either in recovery or you're in denial. So we can look for ourselves in all these places and many more. And in the end, what we'll find is that we keep coming up disappointed. I've been on a journey towards self-discovery for several years now. And many of you know that's intensified over the last year or so. A really rough 2019 marked for me by depression, by discouragement by significant loss and struggle. And in the midst of all of this, I've had this ongoing sense that God is with me even in the hardest moments and that God is using uh, even the pain to help bring me closer into the per- to the person he created me to be. But if you're anything like me and you've set out on this journey to figure out who am I really, to find your true self, you'll find that it's not a very smooth road. It's not just something you can Google, who am I really, and find an answer that satisfies your soul. We look and we keep looking and we try and we keep trying. And it's just for whatever reason, this self, this true me seems elusive. Or you could even say hidden. Somewhere, unexpected, somewhere outside of myself. Maybe even somewhere from another world. So if Jesus cares about our journey towards True self. Where does he tell us to look? Well, Paul sums it up 
beautifully in these few words of Colossians chapter 3, verse 3. Your life is now hidden with Christ in God. If you're ever wondering why it feels like the journey towards self-discovery is so challenging, if your true self feels elusive or hidden, that's because it is. Your life, your true self, is now hidden with Christ in God. What Paul's saying is that our true self is not found in performance, not found in possession, not found in popularity, but it's found in a person. That Jesus himself is the source of our true identity. We are hidden with Christ in God. This morning... I decided I wanted to wear my black jeans today. Instead of looking for them, I just asked Jen where they are. <laughs> Maybe your kids do that as well. Um, <laughs> and Jen knew that, and she said, do you think I hide your pants somewhere where you can't find them? <laughs> do you think like, I have a little game or like secret hiding spots where I put your clothes, just, you'll never look there. <laughs> She's like, I don't know, check your closet. <laughs> um, that's not what Paul means by hidden, either. Like God is trying to be sneaky and keep something from us. He actually means something way more beautiful than that. What we're talking about really throughout much of the book of Colossians, but really in chapter 3, can be summed up in theological language of incorporation. The doctrine of incorporation. Now, most of us, when we hear that word, we think business. But I actually want to help you understand that this beautiful, classic Christian doctrine holds within it the secret to the search for ourselves. <clears throat> the word incorporation comes from the Latin in corporal. Corporal meaning body, where we get the word corpse. And so <clears throat> the doctrine of incorporation says that because of God's great love for us, through the life, death, and resurrection of his son, he has incorporated you and I into one body with Christ. He has brought us in to Jesus so that we are now one person with the Son of God. Another theological term for this is the word union that is central to the message of the gospel of our salvation is that we have been united with Jesus, made one with him. And union with Christ is a phrase that I'm sure you've heard me speak on multiple times, and I will continue to preach it because I'm more convinced than ever that incorporation or union, oneness with Jesus, is the essence of our salvation. It is what it means to be saved, or it is what it means to become Christian. That we become one with Christ. <clears throat> Throughout the New Testament, the authors use the phrase, in Christ, over 160 times. And in fact, rather than the word Christian, this is the way Paul and other New Testament authors refer to us as those who are in Christ. This is our identity, or in other words, this is what it means to be Christian. And nearly every single imaginable aspect of God's presence and work in the lives of his people is described in terms of our incorporation or our union with Jesus. In other words, everything that God does 
to us or for us. He does to us or for us in Christ. Here's a quick list that we have eternal life in Christ. We are justified in Christ. We are glorified in Christ. We are sanctified in Christ. We are called in Christ. We are made alive in Christ. We are made new creation in Christ. We are adopted as children of God in Christ. The list could go on and on and on. Once you see this, you're going to see it everywhere in the Bible. Every aspect of God's interaction in our lives is in the context of our incorporation or our union with Jesus. And so what this means is that we've been made one body, one person. That we've been brought into Jesus so much so that everything about us is now shaped and informed by who he is. Or in other words, everything that's true about him has now become true about us. As I've told you before, remember when the disciples asked Jesus, Lord, teach us how to pray. Jesus says, okay, when you pray, say this. Our Father. What Jesus is doing is saying, my Father has now become your Father. And as those who are in me, you are invited to participate in my relationship with the Father. You get to relate to him as his very Son. This is incredibly good news, and I'll be the first to admit it requires what we might call some theological imagination. And when I say imagination, I don't mean make-believe. I don't mean pretending things are true that aren't true. I mean what comes into our mind, what image do we have when we picture God and ourselves in relationship to God? What is the imagination that the Spirit of God would give us? How does he want us to think of God and think of ourselves in relationship to God? Paul's theological imagination is consumed with this idea of incorporation or union or oneness. That we have been made into one person, one body with Christ. So that what's true about him has now become true about us. Now, the truth is that this is something that has already happened in, ours, in us. This is something that's true about us, whether we believe it or not, whether we understand it or not, whether we're aware of it or not. For those of us that are in Christ, we have been united with him. And so this journey that Paul's inviting us on is a journey towards realizing and exploring the depths and the beauty of what already is. If you've been to a kid's sporting event recently, you may have seen a sign that uh, says something like this. <clears throat> Reminders from your child. I'm a kid. It's just a game. My coach is a volunteer. The officials are humans. And no college scholarships will be handed out today. <laughs> Thank you and have fun. <laughs> I love that. Um, why do they need to post signs like this at Little League fields and soccer, <laughs> soccer stadiums? Because we all know that there are some parents that need to re be reminded of such things. We know that there are some parents who have a tendency to attach too much meaning to kid, their kids' sports, too much value to get too invested or too fired up. Now, why does that happen? There's probably lots of reasons. But one of the reasons is that some parents, in their quests to find themselves, look to their kids. And if their kid is successful 
or talented on the sports field or wherever else, then the parent feels that they are successful or talented, and therefore their life has meaning or value or purpose or whatever. What do we call that when a parent tries to live through their kid? Living vicariously. We say they're living vicariously. Vicariously means that rather than living your own life, you're trying <clears throat> to live, you're trying to use someone else's life and use someone else's experience to find meaning and purpose. And so sometimes parents are trying to redeem their own broken dreams through their children. If I was the kid that was always picked last, or if I was the kid that didn't make varsity, or if I was the kid that couldn't get a date, or whatever it is, then I'm gonna do everything I can to make sure my kid wins and succeeds and does well. Somehow hoping that that can redeem the brokenness in my own story and my own soul. And I think we know that when this kind of thing is taken to extremes, living vicariously through your child it can lead to incredible damage, both for you and for your kid. It's not fair to them or fair to you. Now, the tendency to live vicariously isn't just limited to parents and kids. In fact, our culture is now overflowing with opportunities for us to do this, for us to escape our own lives and attempt to live the life of someone else, right? Of course, we always have the narratives of books, movies, and TV shows. We binge watch Netflix so I can be Don Draper or I can be whoever it is and see the world live the life of somebody else. But of course, social media easily becomes this trap as well. Through Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, whatever else, I <clears throat> become obsessed with seeing the world through someone else's eyes, experiencing life through someone else's feed. Video games, of course, open the door for this, especially now with VR and other technologies where we literally take on an avatar, avatar, an identity, a person other than ourselves and create a whole new world. The culture is moving so quickly down this road. The vicarious living is something that we participate in without even realizing it. What's interesting is that even the idea of searching for yourself, even the idea of looking for answers, this language of searching for the true me, even searching has been hijacked. To search for something used to imply a pretty intense, single-minded focus and hunt. Now when we say search, what do we mean? Google. <laughs> like, we took a really loaded word that had a lot of meaning and a lot of depth and, and shaped a significant season of life. Like, I've been searching for answers, searching for meaning, searching for truth. Sometimes I sit down with my fellow millennials, and I'm like, when you say searching, you mean typing on your phone? <laughs> you mean sitting in your room typing, and you're calling that a search. You're Googling. I give you that. You're not really searching, are you? It's easier than ever to fall into the trap of trying to live our lives through someone else. And it's not all terrible, but it, it does expose that we're all on this journey to figure out who we really are. So throughout this passage, in Colossians 2.20 says, since you died with Christ, and then in Colossians 3.1, you've been raised with Christ, and now in Colossians 3.4, he says, when Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will appear with him in glory. What's Paul saying? We've died with Christ, we've been raised with Christ, we will appear with Christ in the resurrection. What is the invitation of the gospel of incorporation or the gospel of union. The invitation is to live vicariously through Jesus. To live our life through him. To let his death be our death, his resurrection be our resurrection, his glory be our glory.
One of my favorite theologians who died 10 or so years ago, T.F. Torrance, great Scottish Reformed theologian. He tells a story about when he was a young pastor. It's in the book, uh, The Mediation of Christ. And he was a young pastor, and he was showing up at his new assignment in a church full of old-timers. And one of the old-timers on his first Sunday grilled Torrance about his salvation. And he asked Torrance, have you been born again? And Torrance said he had. And the old-timer said, well, when were you born again? And Torrance answers, I was born again when Jesus Christ was born of the Virgin Mary and rose again from the virgin tomb. This obviously wasn't the answer that the old timer was expecting. He was expecting, yeah, in sixth grade at summer camp. (laughs) But do you see how seriously Torrance takes this gospel of incorporation, this doctrine of union, He explained his answer, and I'll just read it to you. He said, this Tom Torrance you see is full of corruption, but the real Tom Torrance is hidden in Christ, hidden with Christ in God, and will be revealed only when Jesus comes again. He took my corrupt humanity in his incarnation, sanctified, cleansed, and redeemed it, giving it new birth in his death and resurrection. So when were you born again? In the virgin womb and the virgin tomb. Because you are now one with Christ. Several years ago, here, I was preaching a message on a similar topic. This has become a a theme of my life and You'll hear it from me a lot. And I kind of was proclaiming this gospel, that you are now one with Jesus. And whatever is true of Jesus is now true of you. Or another way I like to put it is, what does God really think about you? Or you know that God loves you, but do you actually think God likes you? How does God really feel about you? And the answer to that question is, well, how does God feel about Jesus? I like to preach this kind of message a lot. And that time when I was preaching it here several years ago, somebody who knows me well came up afterwards and said, Pete, this is such a great message, and I really want to believe it. But they kind of like pulled me in close. They're like, but I have to ask, do you actually believe this about yourself? And they're kind of saying, I see you up there proclaiming this gospel to a room full of saints. But I'm wondering if you actually believe this to be true about you. Do you actually believe this yourself, Pete? And my honest answer is, sometimes. (laughs) Sometimes I do. I want to believe it, but I don't always. Sometimes it's easy to believe. Sometimes I can believe this message without trying. Sometimes I can live in the loving acceptance of my Father. Sometimes I can live in the peaceful presence of my Savior. Sometimes I can live in the comforting power of the Spirit without even trying. And other times, I have to work hard. I have to choose to believe it, even when it doesn't feel true. What do we call that? What do we call it when we choose to believe something, even when it's hard, even when it doesn't feel true? Well, I think if we go to the beginning of this chapter, we could say, we call it setting our minds on things above, not on earthly things. We call it choosing to take God at his word, 
choosing to believe what he has said to be true about us. Part of what makes this such a challenge is that we understand there's an already and not yet nature to Christ and his kingdom. On one hand, we understand that through Jesus, God's kingdom has been established on earth. But we also understand that it is still coming in its fullness. So when it comes to the question of my identity or my quest to find my true self, this is another reason why Paul talks about it as something that's hidden. This is the way Jesus talks about his kingdom. It's like a seed that's planted in the ground. It's like a woman who is with child. Is she a mother? Yes, and not yet. When we talk about who we are as those hidden with Christ in God, we're talking about something that is already true and is still becoming true at the same time. And that's why it feels the way it does. That's why sometimes it's easy and sometimes it's hard. Sometimes it's near and sometimes it's far. And so we don't have time to go verse by verse, but from verses five on in this section, as Paul begins to say, therefore, as those whose true identity is hidden with Christ and God, therefore, put to death sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, greed, idolatry, going on, anger, rage, malice, slander, filthy language from your lips, don't lie, all this kind of stuff. He's not saying, by avoiding all those bad things, you will work your way up to a place of acceptance with God. He's saying, you are already one with Christ, one person with him. That's already who you are. And the rest of your life will be the process of becoming who you are. So our paradigm of discipleship or spiritual formation, we summarize with that simple phrase. It's becoming who we are. The journey of our sanctification, our formation, is partnering with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in the process of becoming who we already are in Christ. Two closing thoughts in regards to our incorporation with Jesus. At one level, our incorporation is a personal thing, that Pete Kelly and Jesus are now one. But we also understand that this idea of body is used throughout the New Testament to refer to the church as well. And so to be incorporated into Christ has this other other level of, of meaning when we understand that if I'm in Christ, and if you're in Christ, and if Christ is my father and Christ is your father, then not only am I one with him, but we are one with one another. That we together become the body, the corpus of Jesus. That we find ourselves not in isolation or in individualistic spirituality, but we find ourselves in relationships marked by love. We find ourselves in community. We find ourselves as members of the family of God, sharing life closely with one another. And we'll talk about this more because that's where he goes next week. But for now, I simply want to say that to follow Jesus and to receive his life and his identity doesn't just give us a new life, but it gives us a new family. And this is really one of the most significant aspects of baptism. That when we are baptized, 
We are baptized not only into Christ, but into Christ's family or into his body. So again, if you're a follower of Jesus who hasn't yet been baptized, Easter will be a great time to do that. And one last piece. When we come to this table, in a very real way, we are participating in our incorporation with Jesus. Think about the language of corpus, the language of body. His body broken for us. His blood poured out for us. This is why Christians for centuries have gathered and organized their corporate worship around to the communion table. To take the very life of Jesus into our bodies to receive him and to become one with him. And so listen to Paul's famous framing of this meal that we're about to partake. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Will you stand with me? Help us, Lord Jesus, to find you and to find ourselves in you. Church, I'm going to invite you to pray that prayer after me. Repeat after me. Help us, Lord Jesus, to find you and to find ourselves in you. One more time. Help us, Lord Jesus, to find you and to find ourselves in you. In Jesus' name.